Hey, wonderful. We're live. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Better Business Conversations with Practice Better. I'm Jen, business success coach with Practice Better. And today I'm joined by our very special guest for today's session, Megan Walker. Welcome, Megan. Hi, so glad to be here. Uh, so happy to have you. So I just wanted to do a little intro for anyone tuning in that may be new to you. So Megan is a recovering naturopathic doctor and an anthropologist, focusing on the health optimization of entrepreneurs and game changers. So Megan is currently the host of the Anthropology Podcast, CEO of Anthropology Labs, co-founder of Health Hives, the creator of women's performance supplement line, Badass Fuel, and the chief cheerleader at Clinician Business Labs a platform to assist clinicians to scale and amplify their businesses. Megan is also an award-winning speaker, having spoken on international stages through multiple media outlets on topics related to women's performance, medicine, brain health, and entrepreneurship. Wow. <laughs> so as you all can see, Megan is incredibly accomplished and just has a wealth of knowledge to share with us today. And we're so, so honored to have her here. So today, Megan's going to be talking to us all about the new way of building a practice versus the way it's always been done, which is just such a hot topic that I know our community is going to absolutely love. So Megan, I will hand it over to you to dive in. Oh, thank you so much, Jen. Well, you know, I want to start with a little bit of a, of a story. And that was, I remember I was sitting in um, my third year studying at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, and uh, we we had a business class. And in that business class, someone came in to talk to us about what our careers could look like as naturopathic doctors. And there were really sort of three courses that we could take. You could set up a traditional practice, and I'll circle back to that, where you're either owning the clinic, or you're an associate, or you're a little bit of both. Um, you could have a hybrid where you had a private practice and maybe worked for another company, a supplement company or, or some other type of company in the industry. Or third, there was like this holy grail role route you could take. And this was highly coveted because there was only like three of these positions anywhere in the world. And that was you could work for the government to approve some sort of backdoor natural health thing. And that was really appealing to some people because what it was was security on the backside of a huge investment of time and energy with respect to schooling. And so we sat in this class and there was this panel and they talked about these three different options. And I remember so clearly people, they just, they just finally got around, they skirted around it for a bit and they finally asked, they're like, okay, well, so if I set up my practice, like, what am I going to earn in terms of an income? And everyone was just so optimistic. They were like, oh, like it, you, I mean, you'll bring home an easy $250,000 a year and it'll be no problem. And, and everyone was like, oh, thank goodness. Cause I've been in school for 8,000 years and I've invested all of this time and energy and money into my practice. Well, lo and behold, people, people took them at their word and they came out and they went to start a practice and they went to start a practice. And it wasn't as, it was not as easy as getting your branding done and having a logo and stepping out and, and having a title. Um, you really had to work to get those patients. And then people quickly went, wait a second. Like, even if I filled 40 hours a week with patients, which we all know is an impossibility because there's work that happens on the backside of what it is that we do as practitioners, what they suddenly realize is they're like, I don't know where this elusive figure was coming from that was tossed around in our business class, but I can't find the route to get there. And I became really fascinated with not only was I a practicing naturopathic doctor, um, but I, you know, I had a successful practice and I was still toying around with like, what is the route to this number? What is the route to this number that isn't actually simultaneously going to destroy my health or keep me from seeing my family? And so I became really fascinated with, with how do we start to build a financially sustainable career as naturopathic doctors, nutritionists, psychotherapists, it doesn't matter what credential you hold. It's actually the same story for all of us. We've traditionally worked in this manner where we face our patients. We see them day in and day out. We have this one-on-one -on -one practice. Maybe we have a dispensary, which some classify as an alternative source of income, but it's not because it's dependent and predicated on us seeing patients one-on-one. -on -one. How do we actually start to build this this life? How do I live the quote unquote, we used to call it the naturopathic lifestyle. How do I, how do I like walk the talk and all the things I'm talking about when I'm working, you know, 10 hours a day and, and, and still feeling like I can never, um, one make ends meet, but get on top of the workload. 
So I became really interested in understanding how do we start to leverage this education that we have and what are some of the assumptions we made in building our business that may or may not be true? Are there better ways of being able to deliver our care? One of the most challenging things we have always faced as practitioners was how do we reach more people? Because it was sort of this inconvenient truth within our reality, our financial reality, that's actually very expensive to deliver one-on-one -on -one care. And as we got out and as we tried to build and understand what is the sustainable model of practice, what we, what we realized is that delivering one-on-one -on -one care was actually even way more expensive than we were anticipating the first time around. And so when we leaned into addressing the cost of care delivery, we leaned further away from our underlying desire, which is, I just wanna help more people. And so there was this conflict and this tension. And what it really meant was the traditional care model, this one-on-one -on -one practice, it didn't work well for practitioners. When we started to survey patients, what we found is most patients were really working with practitioners for four, maybe five visits. And then they too were kind of like, I don't know where this is going. And when I, what's the off-ramp of this ongoing investment? And oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. And is there a more efficient way for me to be able to acquire this this knowledge. So it wasn't necessarily working for patients either. And so I really started to step back and explore what does, what does a new model of care look like? How do we maintain a standard of care where we're still delivering things safely, but how do we do it in such a way that we have our cake and eat it too? And I'm actually massively obsessed with this idea of how do we have our cake and eat it too? And so what we um, have developed uh, in my company, Clinician Business Labs, is a, a patient journey, and I'm going to take everybody through it, and I'll, I'll share my screen in a second, a patient journey that actually acknowledges the states of readiness that people move through as they decide to make this journey and make the shift and change with respect to their health. And what's really neat is we align that with different offerings within our business as practitioners so that not everything is dependent on us as one-on-one -on -one practitioners. And not only is not everything dependent on us as one-on-one -on -one practitioners, but we are also simultaneously developing our own intellectual property, our own methodology, which in and of itself is something that is leverageable into the future. The old way of doing it, we would leave school, we'd see patients, we'd try to build this one-on-one -on -one practice, meant we were depleting our time over the course of our career, and we were creating less and less leverageability. What do I mean by that? We're, we're literally digging this tunnel where we're like, I can earn more and I have better cash flow every single year, but I don't have time to do anything else with my life. I definitely don't have time to do anything else with my career. When I go on vacation, I, I lose my income. I lose my, I lose access to my cash flow. And when I get 20 years in and I'm looking around going, what else am I going to do with my life? What I have created is this asset in this practice that actually isn't sellable. It's not sellable because it was based entirely on me. So we helped lots of people, but we kind of dug ourselves into this unleverageable tunnel. And that's okay. I know a lot of people would be like, well, that's fine. That's what I knew that I signed up for. But here's what I also found along my journey is that some people would be five years into that tunnel and they had a parent, a spouse, or a child who needed them at home. And suddenly they had to change the structure. And what happened? It was an entirely untenable career for them. Again, what if we could have our cake and eat it too? What would that look like? How can we provide patient outcomes that are as good or better? And how do we create security within our, our practice so that we're building towards a leverageable asset? We're building something that actually can be passed on to new generations of practitioners. And that's what I want to talk about. So I am going to share my, I'm going to share my screen because it makes all of this a little bit easier when we kind of build these pieces and bring them to life. And I'm going to hit play on this portion as well. So we call, I call this our, our CEO system. And the thing that I think is really important um, to understand here is that from a mindset perspective, what I want everyone to just kind of do is I want people to be able to put themselves on a train, put themselves on a train that is driving into a station and the train that you are on is the train of how it has always been done. And what I want you to do, what I want you to just trust me on is being able to go into the, go into the station on that train. You can grab all your fancy luggage, which is your really expensive education and all the tools that you earned along the way. And I want you to cross the platform because the challenge with the train that you've been on the way that we've always done it is it's actually hit the end of the road. 
There's nothing else that we can do with that single train that we're on. And what I want you to do is cross the platform and get onto a new train with me. And now that I'm talking about this, I'm like, oh, we're gonna, we're, we're at slide one of the 70 slides I wanna show you. I'm gonna step out of it for one second while I keep talking. But what I want you guys to be able to um, do, I'm actually gonna keep it like this. I'm gonna keep it totally raw. So it doesn't, for some reason, it's bringing me right back to the beginning. I want you guys to be able to start to picture something entirely different. So we've crossed the tracks. We are now on this new train and the new train is now actually moving forward. So we haven't hit this dead end in terms of where we have always, uh, how we've always done it and where we're going to go. So what I want you to do before you think about what this looks like from a business perspective is I want to actually take you through the journey of your patients, because this is what it's all about. I want to take you through an understanding of what their journey looks like as they step into, I'm going to use naturopathic medicine as an example here, but I don't want people to feel like this is restrictive to that. We could be talking functional medicine, acupuncture and TCM, nutrition, it doesn't matter. Patients, when they start to explore our systems of medicine have been let out at a line. I call it the line of fine. The traditional medical systems role and responsibility is to get people to this line of you are fine. You are okay. Your blood work is just squeaked across the line. You are fine. Like best of luck, come back if you fall below the line. So we all know how to hang out in the traditional realm when we're not fine, right? We're not okay. We go to the doctor, we get a prescription. We are told to change our diet or do whatever we need to do so that we can all get over the line of fine again. And then we're on our own. My feeling is that when people are left and dropped off at that line of, at line of fine, they have this sinking sensation that there's probably more to their health than meets the eye. And the idea of, I'm going to go to YouTube and check out Google and read some books on how to achieve optimal health is, is massively overwhelming for most people. And frankly, it's probably not their main source of interest. We're all fascinated in it. They are not. And so what happens is, is they sit and they do, I wish I had my phone right in front of me. They sit and they do what we all do about all these other areas of our life. They're lying in bed and they're flicking through their phone and, and they're becoming inspired as they do that, and they're in what I call, you can see right up here, see, I have total editorial control now. They're in what we call the aspirational phase. They're like on that line of fun and they're like, what do you mean I could eat differently and feel less bloated? What do you mean I can hydrate myself from something other than water? Cause I hate water. Like, like their mind is blown by these simple concepts. So it's really important to understand that when everyone else is hanging out of that aspirational phase, we are like 12 years down the pathway of indoctrination on these systems of care. Not everyone is there with us. And so this aspirational phase right here, this is where people, they're not paying to visit us one-on-one. -on -one. They have, they can't even pronounce our professional designations, let alone understand why they're going to pay $300 to sit across from us but they're totally fascinated by our message online. They're totally fascinated by that free download they got, which is like the 10 best foods to go and pick up at, at Whole Foods or Loblaws or their local farmer's market. Those things are really useful to them. They're experimenting. And as they experiment a little bit more, what they do is they move into the next phase. I call this the empowered phase. This is where they're like, they're sitting around with their, with their girlfriends and they're like, yeah, I've been drinking kombucha for three months. Yeah. I've been having sourdough. Uh -huh, I've introduced fermented foods. Yes. I've been exercising more. I do feel really good. It's the first time where they've really associated action that they have taken with changes in their health. It's the first time where they're like, Whoa, I have control here. It's also for many people, the first time they're starting to pay for any type of health on the opposite side of the line of fine. Because before for them, I only paid for it when it was a problem. And now they're like, whoa, I am paying for it. So I can move further into a state of optimization. This is a new concept for a lot of people. In fact, most people, this is a new concept. They're not spending money to see you one-on-one -on -one yet, but this is where they're maybe buying a really simple online program. They're definitely buying books. They're starting to listen to podcasts. They're investing their time or money more deeply into this idea of health. They're moving way past that line of fine, deeper in that state of optimization. We're going to come back to what that means for you and your business. Now, when people are here, one of two things really starts to happen. They're either like, whoa, they're like watching Jen's Instagram. I'm like, she's amazing. She's got such great things to say. They're telling all her friends about her. They're like, 
what else is this woman selling? Because I will buy it. I love what she is about. And for those people who don't necessarily have something wrong, they're just going deeper on that journey. What they're doing is they're going, I want to invest in my growth in this area. And they're coming straight down here. This is why I didn't draw this as a linear experience because it's not a linear experience for everybody. And so there they went from empowered and they're like, oh my gosh, I love everything Jen is doing. And I come down here, I'm going to invest in growth. And then some people are hanging out in this empowered face and they're like, Huh, it's like everyone else is doing really well. They did the candida cleanse and then the master's cleanse and then the whatever else. And they're all feeling great. And I'm not feeling great. What's going on. And these people are deep enough past that line of fine that they're now starting to understand the language of this world. They're starting to, to understand what a naturopathic doctor does, what, uh, what traditional Chinese medicine might be about, what a nutritionist might offer in comparison. And they're going, huh, I think I actually need a little bit more help. And that's when they cross over here. And they're crossing over here on the diagonal to a strategic one-on-one -on -one offering. It's the only place of the four quadrants where we have one-on-one -on -one care. Why? Because this is the biggest commitment someone is going to have to make. We tend to do this thing where we go, oh, people don't come and necessarily work with us one-on-one -on -one because of the cost. In my experience, the cost is very rarely the reason people don't come and work with us. I consider this a high ticket experience, not because of the price tag, but because of the confluence of price, time investment, and personal vulnerability. I think we forget about that. When I would ask patients, what took you so long to come and see me? I treated tons of Crohn's and colitis, in the, especially in the early part of my career. And these patients were really sick. And I'd say, what took so long for you to get here? And they're like, oh, I just honestly, I just didn't want to have to tell you about certain things about my life. I didn't want to tell you. I didn't want to talk about my bowel movements for more person. I didn't want to tell you that I can't sleep at night. And sometimes I drink alcohol at two o'clock in the morning to put myself to sleep. I didn't want to tell anybody that I had an abortion at 18. We do this thing where we just assume people don't want to see us because of the price. And we forget how vulnerable it is to sit across on someone who is an expert in health and then feel like we're not going to be judged. It's a really big step for people to step into that one-on-one -on -one care. And for me as a practitioner, what I realized early on, I could move the needle on the health of literally thousands of people when I acknowledged that not everyone was in this quadrant. And when I talk about what's the new way of doing it, it's not because it's all bad. One-on-one -on -one care is incredible. It's just not incredible for everyone. And it's highly unleveraged. And back to this theme of, can I have my cake and eat it too? I want to look at creating a model that can not only move the needle on my patient's lives. I want to create a model that will move the needle on my life. Maybe what we need to do is just take a step back and broaden the view of the microscope because there might be more that we can offer here. And so what happens is I work with people strategically one-on-one -on -one, and I don't just have a few transactional visits with them. That was the other part of the tunnel building that we've done. We saw them, we did an intake, we gave them some things, they came back, we changed the things, they went away, they came back, they came back. And then after four or five appointments of them coming in and collecting more supplements and more dietary restrictions, they're kind of like, now, like, wh when is this ever going to stop? They didn't know what the transformation was going to look like. They didn't know when the whole system was going to be over. And so what happened was... We had people who had four, five, six transactions with us, and then they left. We never got resolution. We never got them better. We just got them disappointed. And so when I talk about working with someone strategically one-on-one, -on -one, what I'm talking about is having a focus to your practice, being able to articulate, I know that you are here and you're dealing with this. And what we're going to do working together is we're going to get you over here. This is what the outcome is going to look like. Here's how long it is going to take. Here are the types of things and testing that we're going to do along the way. And I'm going to actually take you through the framework of what needs to be included in that transformational process. So this, this strategic one-on-one -on -one transformational experience is aimed to create resolution for people and resolution where they have a very distinct roadmap of how they're going to get there. Now, when we get them there, this is where we really have the opportunity to continue to inspire them deeper past that line of fine. When I first started practice, our, our mentors and teachers in school, they would say, okay, so when someone's like done, when they're better, we just, we recommend you, you know, book them in for a physical in a year from now so that they come back and you stay connected. I don't know about you, but the least the least fun thing in my calendar every year is going in for a physical exam. I don't want that to be the sentiment. Like this is when people are maximally engaged. This is when they went, Oh my gosh, I was just working with Dr. Walker for the last eight months. She is amazing. Like I'm so inspired. What do I do next? I'm like, come back in a year for your pap. And they're like, Oh, like, it's just this huge letdown. We're like falling off the side of a mountain. So 
I mean, you should get a pap, but I'm also saying it's like falling off the side of a mountain. And so when we talk about hitting the end of this strategic transformation, this is when people are maximally engaged. And so what do I want to do? I want to move them into that growth phase too. I remember having this patient, I worked with her. She lost 150 pounds working with me. Weight loss wasn't even what I did. We just like made her healthy and she was doing really well. And she came back a year later, she made it all back. And I went, what happened? She's like, I went home for Christmas. And I was like, and what happened? She's like, it wasn't the food. It was my family shaming me for not eating like all of them. See, if we don't attend to the growth phase of someone's care, if we don't continue to work with them to reinforce that this incredibly huge decision that they made, which is to take care of themselves was actually worth it. We send them back to the environment that facilitated and enabled that lifestyle condition in the first place. And they're right back where they started. So I don't see it as a, as a practitioner, as me being disingenuous, wanting to continue to work with someone in some capacity, once we've achieved resolution, I actually see it as my responsibility, but what we never had before was a model for that to happen. And so the model for that to happen is here in the growth phase. So I just took you through the journey patients in the aspirational, then they're empowered they're trying everything. It drives us crazy as practitioners, but it's really important. They can move down here to growth. They can move over here to strategic and then onto that growth phase. You can continue to be innovative here, but what does that actually look like? Well, in really practical terms, what that looks like here is like really wicked social media presence, really great lead magnets, really solid communication for free with people about the outcome that's potential that, that they have the potential to achieve with their health. What does it mean over here in this empowerment phase? It means you're part of the conversation around what's happening in the digital space with respect to health information. We saw in 2020, a 534% increase in online programming related to uh, health education, proactive, optimized health education. Are you part of that conversation? This is where it doesn't have to be a $10,000 digital course. It can be something really simple where you're positioning yourself as an, as an individual uh, speaking from a place of authority in a particular subject matter, we are past this day and age where you can exist without a niche in the health space. People want the best person to care for their condition. They don't want any person to, I know that rocks people's world a little bit. You can't compete in this space without having a focus to your practice. My next question is, do you have a transformational process here? I want you to have a transformational process because what it means is your patients understand their journey. It also means we now have a piece of intellectual property that is uniquely leverageable for you. So we've created an income stream here. We're creating an income stream here. We're creating a leverageable, sellable, scalable entity here, not just one-off transactions, but a whole system that can be sold to other people down the road. And then over here in this growth phase, what does this look like? Well, this looks like maybe a group program. It could be a membership. It could be a podcast with episodes behind a paywall. There's infinite number of things that we can start to add here in growth. And what happens when we start to break this down, we really get nuanced in each of these areas. We went from having one stream of income with everything predicated upon it to more than eight different streams of income that we can put in place and a capacity to work with patients longer and in a more fulsome way and to be more accessible. See, the thing I hear from practitioners over and over and over again is that I just want to help people. And to just help people means we have to start to switch the model in terms of how it's always been done. And I want to just really quickly take people through something a little bit deeper with respect to this concept. And this is this idea of transformation. I'm going to talk about it from the 30,000 foot level, and I'm going to talk about it quickly, but I want you to have context for why I care about this so much because when we did this transactional thing as practitioners, and I ran the numbers on this in my own practice, I'd get to, I'd get to visit five or six if I was lucky with someone and they would always fall off. And when I looked at, you know, what we charged to do that, that'd be like six fifty seven hundred dollars worth of working with someone. That was the lifetime value of that patient, ton of work to get them in the door, lifetime value of $600 that left me in a very risky position as a business owner. And I wasn't getting resolution with respect to their care. What happens when we start to deliver transformation? When we start to deliver transformation, what we saw is people going from six visits to now one, engaging with a product in that quadrant number two, that empowerment phase, two, moving through that transformational process and then moving into that growth phase. We went way beyond five visits with them. What we now did is we said, listen, I'm going to probably see you every three weeks for the next six to nine months because everybody's a little bit different. And they went, okay, great. What's going to happen? And I would explain to them exactly what's going to happen. The lifetime value of my patients went from being about 650 to 700 per person to well over 4,000 per person. And they got better resolution. 
And it was all on their own timeline of their own driving. So we met people where they were at. We increased the health of our business and we got better outcomes for patients. It was a win-win-win for everybody. So when I talk about transformation, I use the acronym ACTION because everyone goes, well, what the heck do I include in a transformational process? I'll tell you really quickly. And I want you to remember this acronym. You can take a screenshot if it's really helpful. There's three phases if we go right to the bottom. There's what we call the discovery phase. This is where we're opening that relationship with people. This is really important. It's the first time they've ever really learned about their health. Then we're gonna move into a phase called the active phase of care. This is where we fix the thing that they actually came in the door for. You have to do that. There's a reason that they're investing. They want that thing gone. It's your job to help them get rid of it. Recognizing you can't make promises. So I'm not sitting here being like, promise everyone you can get them well. Of course not. But as an experienced clinician, you really can speak to expected outcomes and results. And I would always say, listen, this is what I expect will happen. And if it doesn't, that's also important clinical information for us to have. But nine times out of 10, this is how it's going to go. That's that active phase of care. And then maintenance, that's that growth phase. How do we keep them engaged? How do we keep them, how do we keep them growing with respect to their health? So here's what we need to have in order to deliver an effective transformational program. It starts with A, alignment. Are you the right person for treating the thing that they have going on? If they need their Crohn's and colitis fixed and you are an expert in autoimmune conditions, although I understand philosophically how you can treat everyone, they do not. And so if you want to establish trust early in your relationship, we need strong alignment. So you've got to put your stake in the ground at what you do and what you're really good at. And you need to be able to speak to that piece. It's part of establishing trust early, which is a prerequisite for effective patient care. The C of the action framework really stands for communication, but here I also have it talking to this notion of care plan. And what we do here with the C is we need to be able to speak to what that entire transformational process will look like. What are each of the pillars that patients will move through? What is the objective testing that you're going to do at each of those phases so that we can measure the results? What type of symptomatic outcome can we expect as they move through each of those phases or what we call pillars of care? We have to be able to communicate that early on, not as we go. T stands for traction. So you might be all excited about where they're going to be able to go. You need to keep them engaged. There's a reason why after the first appointment, patients are totally gung ho. They do everything you say. And then by appointment four, they keep canceling and pushing it out and canceling and pushing it out and canceling and pushing it out because there's no dopamine left. It's pure willpower. So how do we keep them engaged and excited? There's really cool apps. Some people engage health coaches to make that happen. You need a person or a thing in your transformational process that actually pulls people through the process. And it can't just be you because you aren't the coach anymore. You are the strategist in their care. And it's really hard to be able to wear both hats. The I of the action framework stands for investigation. I believe really strongly in having objective markers that not only measure where they're at when they come in, but their progress along the way. You could be a psychotherapist and you could use some type of index. You could be um, a naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doc, and you're using functional medicine tests at each of these different pillars along the course of their journey, you need to leverage objective findings so they can actually measure their progress. It's not just a subjective experience along the way. Then it's your word against theirs. This is belief system. It creates doubt. You need numbers and you need objective findings. The O stands for others. Who else is going to be part of this care journey? What happens when your patient is three quarters of the way through the transformational process and throws their back out and they need to go see an expert for that to be able to move them forward? I found the strongest way of, of further reinforcing someone's trust in you is by actually being able to refer them to a team of trusted individuals who can help support their care so they don't miss a beat. You need to have others in place. You need to know who else they might need to see. The N stands for next steps constantly communicating where we're going to go next, why I'm going to see you, what we are doing today. Your patients should never be questioning why they showed up because again, what we're doing is we're driving them based on this model of willpower, not necessarily a knowledge of where we are going to go. The fastest way to get someone to come out, fall out of transformation is they lose track of where they are going next. What is their next, next benchmark or milestone? I remember running this half marathon once and I got to kilometer 10. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did I sign up for? And then I, I, I had this self-talk. I was like, okay, you can see marker at kilometer 11 down there. You just have to get there. 
And then I'd get there and I'm like, okay, you can quit now, or you can just get to number 12. I'd be like, okay, I just got to number 12. If they didn't have those markers along the way, and I had no idea how long this experience was going to carry on for, I probably would have given myself permission to leave the course earlier. They have to, I can't, it's the most important thing here. They have to know what that next step is going to look like and why they're doing it. Why are they taking that supplement? Why are they coming back? Why are they doing that testing? How close are they to the next benchmark? It's really imperative that you communicate those pieces. And the neat thing about delivering transformation is it simultaneously moves us out of a model that all of us resent, which is this time for money model. The fastest way to move out of selling your time is to sell your strategy. And the beautiful thing about selling your strategy is it comes at a much higher premium than your time. I always had this real ethical issue with this idea of selling uh, my time and practice because it meant I had to acknowledge that my time was probably worth more than theirs. Or it made me have to acknowledge that their time is worth more than mine, which used to drive me bananas. Because if we're actually talking about equality, I actually think everyone's time here is equal. And what we're truly selling people as practitioners is greater access to higher quality time higher quality times, what we do, we mitigate their pain. We increase their quality of life. We are giving people access to higher quality time. I don't want to sell my time. I want to sell my strategy. I want to move right out of that model. The fastest way to do that is you actually have to first start by no longer naming your appointments after blocks of time. It's no longer the 30 minute follow-up that I sell for this. It is the like motivational, whatever, or the momentum appointment, whatever you want it to be. It will take up to 30 minutes of your time You can always communicate that for scheduling, but stop selling your time. And the way you stop selling your time is you design transformation. So these things start to work in an interplay. This is a different way of looking about your business of health. It's not better or worse. It's not prioritizing money over the care of other people. What it is actually doing is it's building in sustainability into your practice. And when we build sustainability into our practice, we decrease risk in our practice. And when we decrease risk in our practice, we actually drive down the cost of care delivery. The way we did it before was the riskiest way we could possibly run a business. And there's only one place we can place risk when we're running a business, and that is onto our customer's shoulders, which is totally the antithesis of what I want to do as a caring practitioner. I want to diversify risk. I want to mitigate risk so that I can create a model that enables me to provide more accessible care. So here's the last thing I want to talk about with everybody, because here's inevitably where people go. This is fantastic, Megan. Thanks so much for sharing. I don't have time to implement this because I'm so busy seeing my patients one-on-one. So I want to talk about that really quickly, because here's what happens when we start to work with practitioners around this piece. And I really want you to check in with yourself here is they come in and they go, okay, well, approximately I'm talking about your working week here. I'm not talking about what you do in your off time. 60% of your working week for most practitioners in the old way was seeing patients. And then they hit their max. They either were emotionally exhausted or they were physically exhausted. They ran out of time because if we're going to do 60% of our time with patients, 30% of our time is spent on follow-up research and admin. If I were to give that a different label, it would be unpaid work because what we don't do in our traditional model in an attempt to make ourselves successful is we don't account for the cost of that other 30% there. All of the support, time, energy, knowledge, and unique credentialing that you hold and that enables you to show up in that 60% of the time. So we have 30% unpaid work. And then what we do is we keep going, oh, this isn't working. I'm getting exhausted. I want to create passive sources of income. I want to build into the future, but then we dedicate less than 5% of our working week towards building our future state in our business. And we spend less than 5% of our time on strategic relationships and the strategy of our business that's going to enable us to get somewhere else. Why? Because we're like, I just want to help people. I didn't do this to become an entrepreneur. I did this because I'm a practitioner. I just unfortunately have to do this other piece. But what if you could have your cake and eat it too? What would that have to look like in terms of time? Here's where we aim to go with practitioners. 25% of your time is seeing patients. 25. Why? Because we're mitigating your risk. Because when 60% of your week is seeing patients, you have, don't have time to create other things. You also don't have time for anything to go wrong. You need to be home with your spouse. You need to be, you need to be, I don't know, like recovering for your own reasons on vacation. You can't do it. You can't do it because so much of your income 
is forced into that 60% of the time. And some of you may be fortunate enough that you have income from other sources, which is great. But if we build an entire industry's model on hopefully I have somebody else's income to support me, what we do is we, we make this a highly inaccessible career to the average person. We need to build this in such a way that not only is our medicine accessible, but our model of care is accessible to people too. 25% of your time seeing patients, that gives you flexibility. 15% of your time then doing admin research and support. 30% of your time is on business building, maybe making new programs, maybe looking at implementing diverse sources of income, all based on your primary credentials. Maybe looking three years down the road and working on that project that you know is going to facilitate some sort of disruptive action within our industry, or maybe just building something else that works really well for you. 30% of your time should be on building your business into the future. And 30% of your time should be on the strategy and on the relationships that will enable you to grow and reach more people. This is what we have to do with someone's time if we want to start to build into that new model. If we truly want to reach more people, we have to look at doing it differently than it's always been done. And this shouldn't come as a source of stress for people. This should come as a source of relief. It should come as a source of relief because it is an opportunity for not everything to be resting on your shoulders, to not everything to have to be predicated on you delivering your time and your energy one-on-one -on -one with people. Now we're starting to diversify how we deliver care. We're starting to diversify conversations that we, with, we have with respect to health. We are truly as practitioners at this point, putting ourselves in a position where we can have our cake and eat it too, most likely gluten-free. And so when I talk about a new model, Jen, that's exactly what I am, I am talking about. I'm talking about really having our cake and eating it too, doing it in such a way that it is fun, that it is sustainable, that there is less risk and that we can reach more people. Wow. That was so impactful, Megan. And I, I just love that, um, that view on things where sort of going back to what you talked about at the beginning, sort of matching the client journey stages with different offerings and sort of the, the need to um, meet them where they're at and that kind of thing. Because I think for many practitioners, they sort of just look at, you know, what do I want to offer? Um, but sort of looking at it from that lens is so impactful and um, can really support, you know, that impact that you want to have with way more people to, to say, okay, they're not all going to be ready for that one-on-one -on -one strategic, you know, relationship. Um, how else can I support them at different stages of that journey? So that's, that's really cool. I love that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've just found that we, we do that because we're so deep in it and we're so passionate about it. We kind of forget that not everyone has spent like all those years in school with us and not everyone has tried out all those cleanses, nor do they want to. So, you know, I think it's a good reminder and there's these huge pockets of people that we can potentially uh, support and assist uh, who weren't walking through our doors. And I really realized that when um, I found I was getting these like really deep, impactful letters from people who were listening to my podcast about how things we were talking about in the podcast had changed their life. And I went, Whoa, like I get those outcomes in my office. And this person just listened to me and was able to achieve that. Like what else is possible when we start to get outside that box of how it has to be done. And we really fight for that. We really fight for like, Oh, everything's got to be one-on-one, -on -one. but, um, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that it does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And also one thing I noticed too, sort of weaved in a few places that you mentioned was sort of this idea of um, the need for systems and tools. This is sort of maybe what I was reading into it, because I think, you know, even when you were talking about, you know, practitioners typically spending, you know, that 30% on the admin, the research, the follow-up, that kind of thing, you want to get them to that 15. Um, how important do you think that having like those systems and tools in place is to making that happen? Well, you know, the slide at the beginning said the CEO system, and we talk about the CEO system. To me, this is really sort of the second phase of practice development, but for someone to really grow a larger impactful practice, I really see three core areas of their business needing to be in, in place. We have the, this, the C part, which is what is your care strategy? What is your transformational process? What does that look like? We've got the, the E section. And I call that empowerment based marketing. What is your marketing system? Not what's the stuff you throw at the wall and you hope it sticks. And then you don't understand why it's there. What is your marketing system that you actually have metrics that you measure? And then O is your operational strategy, which as soon as I say operations, people are like, Ugh. 
but it, that is actually, that's your source of freedom in life. When you have systems around how you spend your time, you have systems around how you track your, your money, you've got key performance indicators for these different areas of your business. Now, you know, when it's time you can hire an assistant. Now, you know, how much you can pay for these different people. You're not sort of gut checking all of these, these components. There's really distinct systems that we can start to implement and deploy. So I talk a lot about this, that there's three core areas. It's the CEO system. You have to have all three of those, uh, those areas taken care of, or at least thought of in your business. And for practitioners who are like, I don't think this way, like if you can understand the Krebs cycle, this stuff's easy. Like this is, this is not, I'm talking three circles with three letters. Like this is, this is not, this is not hard stuff. It's just a different part of your, uh, it's a different part of your brain. And, and to be honest in your own business, you're held entirely to account on being able to have systems in those, uh, in those three areas, but also that's kind of, it's kind of half the fun. Mm -hmm, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and I think it's so important to, to notice sort of those different stages of the client journey and how systems can come into play. I know obviously with practice better, it can really support practitioners in, in doing that and being able to, you know, have those different offerings to meet the client where they're at or the patient where they're at. Um, but yeah, I, I love, I love how you sort of break that down into those three quadrants. So Amazing. Wow. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really, really helpful. And I know our community is just going to absolutely love everything you had to share. Um, I would love to do a shout out to Impact Lives because I know you have that coming up in a few months. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Impact Lives is our annual practitioner uh, event this year. It is like last year, entirely virtual, um, which I find really exciting because we have practitioners from around the world joining us. And our through line for this year's event is, uh, is actually marketing. So over the course of the four day virtual event, we're actually going to be teaching everyone what we call our impact marketing system so that you actually have, the, have the tools and the metrics and the mechanism to be able to, uh, to market, uh, your practice effectively. It is the E of the CEO system. Um, and then we have incredible speakers who are going to be joining us. We've got workshops that are taking place. We've got really interesting and innovative virtual hallway experiences uh, that we're bringing to the table. So our goal really was, can we create this highly accessible event? Can we bring community and can we move the needle on practitioners uh, marketing? That is our goal. It's taking place late in November and um, we're going to have a really good time. Amazing. Yeah. And we'll, we'll put a link below um, this session so everyone can find all the details on Impact Lives. I had the pleasure last year of um, joining virtually and it was such an amazing event. So definitely encourage everyone to check that out. Um, thank you so much, Megan. Thank you for being here, for taking the time to share with our community. Um, and it's always such a pleasure to chat with you. Oh, thanks so much, Jen. Take care.